Hi everyone, my name is Christine. I am the Ontario Agricultural College's uh, Liaison Officer for the University of Guelph. We're here at the Honeybee Research Centre, which is one of our stations at the University of Guelph here. Um, and we're here with Paul and Stephanie. So we're gonna do a little hive tour first and then um, we'll show you some other things. Hi everybody. So this is Paul. And this is Stephanie. Hi there. And what are we doing here? Well, we're just inspecting a uh, beehive here. Uh, each of these piles of boxes is a hive of bees, and inside each hive there's a queen and all her offspring, her workers, which are female, and there's a few drones in there, the male bees. Uh, but we're just taking apart what's called the brood chamber, and that's the bottom box where the queen can roam freely, lay eggs, and raise her young. Uh, Stephanie's got a frame here that has a lot of uh, capped brood on it. And what we call brood is the larva and the pupa. So these are pupa underneath these brown caps here. If we just move our hand on there, or place our hand on there gently, the bees move out of the way, and we can see all these pupa. Some of these will be close to emerging. There's a brand new bee that was just uh, emerged this uh, today. She, she looks kind of fuzzy relative to the other bees. So they have a real fresh, fuzzy look there. So we've got uh, that frame with mostly pupa on it. We'll set that aside. What do you got there, Stephanie? Um, open brood. Some well, open brood. Some pupa. Yeah, some open brood, which is the lar uh, eggs and larva. So if we just look in this area here, where the cells are open, there's little white grubs in there that are the larva. When they get older they fill up that entire cell with their bodies and then the bees add cappings on top that brown capping surface there you can see a cell where the bees have been partly closing that off so they're ready to pupate at that age there's a bee down there that's bringing in some pollen i think that's from butter and eggs a flower that just come into bloom and we may see some orange pollen that's coming in from goldenrod. Uh, goldenrod uh, produces a lot of pollen and a lot of nectar in late August and, and uh, first half of September. So it's a major nectar and pollen plant for us. How do they carry the pollen like that? Well, uh, let me just give you a demonstration here, Christy. You, the mm -hmm. bees have hairy bodies, so they have hair all over their body and that's a defining feature bee. So when they land on the flower, they rub that, their hairy body all over the flower. And then on their front legs, they have brushes and they brush the pollen off like that. And then they transfer it to their back leg, like so. They'll scrape it off here and then they wiggle their leg like that and it pushes the pollen up into what's called a pollen basket. A series of hairs with one anchor hair that hold that pollen in place. As they're doing this, they put a little bit of nectar in with the pollen to make it glom together. And that way they're able to carry a large quantity of pollen back home. When they get home, they fly into the hive, they approach a cell that they're going to have a little hole that they're going to put the pollen into. They use their front legs to knock the pollen off the back legs. And then they use their head to ram the pollen into the cell. So you can see how their bodies are very well adapted for collecting pollen. Very the cool. Nectar they collect inside their body. They suck it up with their tongue, 
hold it in a little honey stomach and then are able to regurgitate that and deposit it in the cell so they can convert nectar to honey uh, by secreting some enzymes that break down the sugars and then drying off the excess moisture so that it will keep so that it doesn't ferment that way they have long term storage of food and the food is their energy for action it's also their heating fuel to keep the hive warm in the winter because they shiver their wing muscles to generate heat and then give each other a great big group hug to hold on to that heat into what we call a cluster so they're not great at social distancing <laughs> uh, and fortunately there's no COVID here but there are other diseases that bees uh, get and that's part of what we do here. So what kind of research are you doing here currently? Well um, we are all our research or most of it is bee health related. We do some production related research as well and breeding of course, but we're, uh, there's a whole host of problems that bees are experiencing. We lose an average of 35% of our colonies over the winter time uh, and that's as a consequence of many different factors. The number one problem is varroa mite, a parasitic mite that uh, came from another species of bee in Asia our bees were not uh, resistant to it, so it's a big problem for our bees. That's our number one problem. There are internal parasites as well, so there's uh, pathogens uh, of a variety of sorts, everything from virus to bacteria to fungus. Uh, and then, of course, we have pesticides issues that we uh, study as well. Uh, and climate change, uh, envi just environmental land use, uh, all sorts of things can create problems for bees. So we're, uh, our approach is to chip away at each of those. Uh, bees are basically overwhelmed with too many problems and it's not one single thing that's uh, creating our uh, uh, decline in bee health. Uh, it's uh, the, uh, this whole range of problems. So we're chipping away at it and having, I think, some success with that. Uh, and as you can see here, we've got lots of hives and they're, they're being quite productive this year. We've had a nice hot summer, so there's lots of nectar coming in. And uh, that's where we're at. Awesome, great work. What else can we see, Stephanie? What else do you have over there? Whoa, look over here. So there is a mother of them all. The queen. There's the queen bee. You can see she has a long abdomen. Her abdomen is full of ovaries. Uh, she can lay up to 2,000 eggs a day, twice her body weight in eggs in one day. Uh, so she's constantly being fed protein by the worker bees uh, to give her the ability to produce all those eggs. Uh, when she's out in the light here, she's not behaving normally. Normally she would be looking from cell to cell, inspecting each cell to see if it can be laid in. And then she'll, once she's inspected the cell, she'll back her abdomen up into a cell and deposit an egg. It comes out of the tip of her abdomen. Um, as you can see, uh, we mark our queens with a dot of paint. Uh, so we mark them a different color. If they're born uh, in one year, we mark them one color. Then the next year we use a different color. So we're able to keep track of how old they are. But even more importantly, that dot makes it easier to find the queens when we're inspecting a hive. So all this brood here is worker brood. They're kind of a, a smaller cell, but if we look down here, we can see drone brood there. Those big bulgy cells, the, the male bees are uh, reared in those. When, so when the queen lays an egg, she measures the size of the cell. If it's a small cell, she lays a fertilized egg, which will become female, either a queen or a worker. If she measures a big cell, she doesn't fertilize the egg, she just deposits it directly. And so the drones don't have a dad. They don't, they develop only from the genetics from the queen. If you look here, you can see what we call the queen's retinue surrounding her. She just smells so good and they want to be licking her, feeding her, cleaning her. At the moment, she's inspecting a cell uh, but she, she really doesn't have room to turn around <laughs> to lay, lay an egg there. As you can see, all those bees are just piled up all the way around her in a circle, all their heads facing towards her. And antenna are working away, uh, smelling her. Their tongues are out trying to, uh, to feed her. 
And so she gets constant attention from the worker bees. Awesome. We've got a question here from the audience. How long does a queen live? Well, she can live for up to four years. Uh, the workers, by contrast, in the summer only live six weeks. So there's a big difference there. Uh, it, four is kind of exceptional. Uh, they typically would uh, live for three years. Uh, and uh, so they, they can live a long time. When they mate, when they're very young, when they're five to 10 days of age, they fly out on a mating flight and then they mate with up to 30 drones. They store that semen in a little vessel in their abdomen called the spermatheca and they can store up to 7 million sperm. So they're fertilized for life and are able to lay uh, fertilized eggs for up to four years. Wow. There's up to 7 million sperm stored in that little spermatheca. Wow, and what happens to the drones when they mate? Well, uh, they make a loud pop and they flip over backwards and <laughs> drop 100 feet from the sky, wow. dead. So it's uh, the, in the mating flight, the drones can smell and see a queen from up to a football field length away, way up in the air. So they chase after her and uh, mate with the queen She's able to mate with uh, quite a number of drones and then she flies back to the hive and, and within a day or two she can start laying eggs and that becomes the, the, her, her job basically for the rest of her life. Wow. So what we're seeing there is all brood in the brood chamber. When we open up uh, the top box over here, we'll be able to see what we call the honey soup. Now we've already harvested our summer honey crop. So the hives would have been about this high earlier, but we've harvested those full boxes of honey and given them an empty box here to fill up with the fall nectar flow. So there may not be much honey to see at the moment, but we'll see some later in our extraction. So I'll just pull that back. We have a canvas inner cover here. We can just pull that out of the way. So it's stuck down with this brown material called propolis. It's a tree resin that bees collect and they use it as a sealant and as an antiseptic. So they're able to keep the hive sterile by uh, smearing this product around. And it comes from right over there from the propolis trees, or pop, sorry, the poplar trees that grow around our property here. That's where they get all their propolis is from poplar trees. Very cool. So we'll just pull that back. And then we'll take out the middle frame. They, when they come up, they start working from the middle and move to the outside. So the middle frame here will have the most, uh, largest amount of honey in it. So if we pull that out, we'll tip it over here. We can see cells that are glistening. They have fresh honey in there or nectar. It, ne it's kind of a, a work in progress when the, when the uh, nectar is put in here they're gradually drying that out and once they get it dry enough that it will keep they seal it up by putting wax on the surface called the capping so that's basically like putting a cap on a, on a jar to seal it up so they'll seal it up and that way it'll, that helps it keep but if I stick my honey in there my sorry my finger there you can see all the honey gushing out yum and <laughs> <laughs> I sure wish I could share this uh, with you. It tastes so great when it's warm <laughs> and fresh inside the hive. So a couple questions from our audience here. How much honey have they produced so far or will they produce this season? Well, we had kind of a slow start this spring. It was very cool for a long time. So the colonies didn't build up as quickly as we liked. And then we had some losses over the winter, so we needed to rebuild our colony numbers so we needed to split hives to get back to the number of colonies that we want to be working with so when you divide hives that decreases their productivity and so we did get uh, a reasonable amount of uh, honey coming in this year but everything was a bit late so not quite up to uh, what we had hoped for but the heat that we've had this summer really means that plants just gush with nectar so that's been a really positive thing and we're really hopeful for the goldenrod flow. Uh, we've got some space here for the bees to fill up and uh, fingers crossed that we'll uh, get a good uh, flow this fall.
Awesome. So we'll see more about honey in a little bit. Um, another question we have here is how do bees know they are returning to their own hive? Well, great question. Um, as you can see, we paint our hives multiple different colors. Bees are really great at recognizing different colors. Just think of flowers and, how, and the colors of flowers. That helps bees orient to the flower. So the colors also help bees orient to their own hive. Uh, we don't put our hives all in a straight line because they're not great at counting. They don't know if they're a number three hive or number four hive. Uh, if they're all in line, that's all they can. Uh, uh, they just don't have um, a good way of orienting. So we place our hive in, from a bee's perspective, kind of a random pattern. We're facing different directions. But we also want to be efficient for us when we're working. So we condense them into a fairly small area. So we're not carrying heavy things around a lot. Beekeeping is, is quite a heavy uh, labor intensive activity so we try and make it as easy as we can. Awesome. Another question we have is why are we not getting stung? Why are we not getting stung? We have really nice bees. Uh, it's a nice sunny day. Both those things are working in our favor. We actually we actively breed our bees for gentle behavior. Nobody likes getting stung, not even a beekeeper. <laughs> so uh, by having nice bees to work with we're able to do that. Uh, we mate our queens on islands in Lake Simcoe. Our research has discovered that the, the defensive behavior, uh, more or less defensive behavior, is inherited from the drones. So that's our own work that's discovered that. So when we mate our queens on an island, we can populate that island with only our own stock, and so we're able to have our queens mate with drones that come from gentle calling. Pass that on. Nice drones. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> so, uh, oh yeah, I'd love to see a drone. Stephanie's Let's got see. A drone there in her right hand. Big bulgy eyes, robust looking, quite handsome, don't you think? Beautiful. Yeah, and over here, whoa, a worker bee. With pollen. With pollen, and uh, that looks like pollen from goldenrod. It's got an orangish color. It, so there you can see the differences there. Yep. And let me just show you one thing here. Mm -hmm. The drone bees are delicious. <laughs> do drones have stingers? Drones do not have stingers. <laughs> and I would definitely not do that. If they did. The worker <laughs> Good call. All right. So that's what we have to see in a beehive. Um, a little later in the year, we'll remove this honey here. Uh, let them fill up that bottom box with honey. We do feed them a bit of sugar syrup to top that up as well. And we make sure the colony is healthy and productive uh, going into winter so they have a good population. If a colony is a little bit weaker, we might join it together with a stronger colony uh, because a weaker colony, low population, just won't make it through the winter. Right. Uh, our research has shown that uh, hives that have less than seven frames of bees are much more likely to die over the winter. Uh, so we know what the measurement is and then we can combine those if they're not up to strength. Then we uh, insulate the hives. Uh, to, they're good at generating heat and conserving it, but we help them out by insulating the hives and uh, reducing the entrances so the wind isn't blowing in through the winter. And then we put a brick on the lid so the lid doesn't blow off and we cross our fingers and we walk away for six months and just leave the bees alone. That's the best thing we can do for them through the winter. Awesome. Is there anything people can do at home to support bee health? Oh sure, lots of things you can do. Number one, you can buy some honey from a local beekeeper because they're, they're uh, providing the bees that are doing the pollination in your own community. So support your local beekeepers, that's the number one thing. Uh, number two would be to consider planting for bees, planting flowers that bees are attracted to. Just look around and see what bees are visiting in your garden and grow more of it. It's pretty simple. Uh, another thing we can do is naturalize some areas uh, because a lot of plants will voluntarily grow uh, if we just leave nature to its own course. Uh, there are things that we can plant, but some those often need to be maintained. In, in nature, if we let things grow that are suited to growing in that area, they take care of themselves. A really big thing we can do though is plant trees and shrubs that benefit bees. Our website has lots of information about uh, nectar plants and uh, those trees and shrubs are there for the long term without a lot of care 
and they automatically mass flowers together in one location. Bees really appreciate that. It's a lot of work to go from one flower to another flower to another flower. If you go to a tree and it's got thousands of flowers on it, it's way more efficient for them. Very so good. The last thing I would suggest is that, that uh, uh, we support the research uh, that we're doing here. We need lots of help and uh, we're building a new uh, center very soon and we're looking for a lot of help to get uh, that center up and going, an education and research center. That'll be very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, we're moving just down the road from here. We have a beautiful spot here, just not enough space for our, our, our plans. But we're building a 10 to $12 million facility that will focus on bee education for uh, the general public, for beekeepers, for gardeners, for, for, for everybody really. And it'll be a, uh, a discovery center where people can come and learn more about bees. We find if we can get people out here into a bee yard, and learning more about bees, they become bee advocates. And it's not just honeybees, it's all bees. Yeah. Our focus is honeybees, but everything we do for honeybees is generally beneficial to all the other pollinators. Speaking of other bees, where do bumblebees come into the picture? So can you talk about a little bit about different pollinators and different breeds of bees sure. right now? Sure, sounds good. Uh, well, uh, bumblebees are quite a bit different than honeybees. They're social, like honeybees, so they live in a social unit. But they start the, the colony in the spring with only a queen. So that if you see a bumblebee in the spring, it's a queen. They're quite big, and you'll see them flying low to the ground, and what they're looking for is a hole in the ground, an abandoned chipmunk nest, because that's where they move in. They even use the chipmunk nest material to move into and create their own nest. So they start with that queen, and then she forages for nectar and pollen, she lays eggs, feeds them the nectar and pollen, and so those offspring are starting to come along. The first offspring are the cutest little bees ever. They're tiny little bumblebees, little fuzzy uh, balls, and they get out and they forage around, and they bring back some nectar and pollen and feed that to the next batch. And so as the summer goes on, they grow progressively bigger bees because there's more individuals feeding them. Uh, towards the end of the summer, they produce queens that fly off and mate. They mate on the ground, unlike honeybees. But So they, they mate and then they disperse. And each individual queen uh, finds a protected area for, under leaves, for example, or some uh, area that protects them from the winter. And they spend the whole winter all by themselves. And then in the spring, when the weather warms up, they start moving around and the cycle starts over again. Uh, that, that cycle uh, is somewhat similar to a lot of the solitary bees we have. In Ontario, we have 423 species of bees. On the planet, there are somewhere between 20 and 30,000 species of bees. So there's more species of bees than there are mammals, reptiles, and amphibians all put together. They've evolved in their own little regions to pollinate specific flowers, and that's why there's so many different bee species. Uh, this, these solitary bees uh, also collect nectar and pollen. That's a bee, by definition, gets all their food from flowers. And it's basically nectar and pollen. So they're able to raise young uh, in, in little holes in the ground or little holes in trees. And they produce their young that spent uh, that overwinter as pupa and emerge the next year so their cycle can carry on. Very cool. Um, so how can students at U of G take courses about bees or get involved here? Because we're part of the University of Guelph, so what can students do to get involved? Sure. Uh, well, uh, that's where I got my start here. I met a guy in the pub that had just taken a beekeeping course and he was so enthusiastic about it. I thought, I gotta do that. And uh, so I took this university apiculture course, one of the most popular courses on campus. And um, we, it, you learn about bee biology, which is just fascinating and some beekeeping. Uh, but we also teach uh, weekend courses for new beekeepers, people that actually want to get right into bees and get started with that. So we teach these weekend courses. It provides foundational education. It's a lifelong learning um, opportunity when you get into beekeeping. Uh, apart from that, we have uh, in the neighborhood of 60 YouTube videos. So we have a YouTube channel 
and uh, we've been broken everything down into basic skills that all add up to becoming a good beekeeper. And so they're really uh, well explained in uh, short little snippets of information, and those have become quite popular. Somewhere around five million views from all over the uh, the world on those. So wow. We plan to do more of them when we can fit them. In. <laughs> yeah, a few of those views are myself, so <laughs> those are great. Um, so students can volunteer here and also work here occasionally too? Great, good point, Christine. Um, uh, we have a student apiculture club. That's how Stephanie kind of came to us here. Uh, she's been very active in the club for quite a few years now. And that, that student club has been going since the 1800s, continuously. So we've got a long tradition here with what we're doing. And those students come out and they do uh, make candles, they make lip balm, they make beeswax food wraps, they package honey, they get out in the bee yard and they help out with some of the fall activities that we're doing, getting our bees ready to go, go into winter. And then they also provide education at the College Royal, uh, at, at other events where they can set up a booth and share all the great news about bees uh, in that way. So it's, it's a really fun group, a very dynamic group, and um, uh, I, I, I just kind of prop it up a little bit, and, but the, the students take it and go. Awesome. So there's that, and we have volunteers, all different age categories there. We have uh, students that volunteer. We have people that take our weekend courses, more, you know, uh, mature people, let's say. And so we've got a, a, a volunteer program, and that people gain some education, some experience, and we get help. So it's a really great mutual Thing. Just like it is working with bees. We help them out, they help us out. Awesome. Uh, one more question we have while we're in the bee yard here is what is that big tower of boxes back there? Well, we like to have a little fun around here. Uh, there's no secret there. Uh, just the other day we had, we were doing bee beards for uh, uh, some employees. If, if they're really good, by the end of the summer <laughs> we'll let them put on a bee beard. So that's kind of fun. Uh, this we did just because as a beekeeper, the higher your colonies are, you know, the better they are. So they, they, uh, so we're just kind of poking a little bit of fun at that by having our giant beehive back there. At the moment, there are no bees in there, but we're looking at this as sort of a prototype for when we do uh, fill that up with bees. Awesome, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> Very fun. Um, I just have another question for you too. The smoker that's back there, what is that used for? Uh, Stephanie can explain that. basic name for what we use it for. Uh, we fill the barrel, if I can open it, uh, with some wood chips and some newspaper. We light a little fire and this is what helps us to work with the bees and keep them calm. So the smoke does a couple things in the hive. Um, it disrupts the honeybee's pheromones, their communication. Um, so if they were to detect the threat, they'd release an alarm pheromone kind of smells like pineapples or bananas so sometimes when you go into a hive and you smell that kind of fruity smell you know that they're uh, not too happy that day but Interesting. with the smoke it helps to disrupt that and they don't uh, consider us a threat when they're not releasing that pheromone. Um, it also causes them to move out of the way when we're working so we can get our fingers or our hive tools in there without harming the bees um, and it also makes them go in and eat honey so they have something else to do while we're working so it's a really good simple tool uh, to help us work with the bees and make sure that they're not getting injured. Awesome, that's great. Can we see some honey? Should we go see what you're doing for extracting? Sure, let's go inside. When we harvest this honey, we take the boxes like that and we load them up onto our truck. First, we have to get the bees out of there. So we have a little trick. We put a one-way exit under the box. The bees go down into the brood chamber or down into the lower honey boxes and then we're able to take the boxes inside with most of the bees taken out. But as you see, we'll get inside. <laughs> a few do get, get in there with us. So let's go inside where, we'll, uh, where we extract our honey. Just follow me around here. As we're going, you can look around, you can see some of the plants that benefit bees. Over here, we have basswood tree, uh, a really great nectar source. The honey has a kind of a minty flavor. Uh, in the back, we have some uh, locust, black locust trees, beautiful smelling white flowers in the, sp in the springtime. Uh, as I've mentioned, there's the poplar trees over there the bees get their resin from, but they also get pollen from that early in the spring. 
And then over here we can see sumac trees, a great pollen and nectar source for midsummer. And pretty well everything you see around here that's green benefits bees. Awesome. Over here we have a new design beehive called the Flow Hive. We haven't got any bees in it yet, but on that one you just turn the tap and honey comes out. So that's pretty cool. A little bit of a bee garden here. This is our solar wax melter. So we put chunks of wax in there that need processing, the little scrapings and so on. And then the heat of the sun melts them down and then we get beeswax coming out. So we'll go in through our workshop. And then through the workshop. Here's some of the honey that we extracted from this year in barrels. We're just going to keep moving along. This is our plot room. And you can see there's a few bees around there. Uh, this room was, has been completely filled three times this year. We're just at the end of extracting our summer honey, though. And so that's what's in these stacks. At the end of the room, you can see our honey tank uh, that, that the honey goes into to settle overnight. It's nice and warm in this room. We keep it at 30 degrees C so that the, um, the honey flows well when we go to extract it. We're just going to put our mask on here since we're inside. And when that honey goes into that tank, it has the opportunity to settle. So there will be little bits of beeswax in that, but we want to float to the surface. And then we're able to drain the clean honey off the bottom of the tank into the barrels that you can see in there. We're going into the extracting room. It's quite noisy. All right. So here we have Muhammad. Uh, and the other end of the room, we have William. Uh, this is our extracting room. So let's start at the far end. That's where we take the honey boxes first. So William's got a stack of honey boxes. So these are all full of honey. He's scraping the wax off the top to clean him up a bit, but we, we keep every little bit of wax that we produce here. So he'll pry one of those frames out, and then he, what he's doing right now is loosening them up. That problem is really stuck and sticks them down, so you have to loosen everything up first. And then he's going to put them into this machine, which is called the uncapper. It's really noisy, but the frame goes in, comes down through some, some vibrating knives. Those vibrating knives remove the, the cappings from the surface, and so we can then centrifuge the honey and spin it out of these frames. So they just go through one after another, and it uncaps both sides of the frame at the same time. So William's just gonna shut that off so it's a bit quieter, and we're gonna move down here to the extractor. So this, I'll just shut it off, put on the brief, and you'll see what that looks like here. So those are the frames that spin around and the honey comes out. You can see the honey dripping down here. Yum. So spin around, <laughs> the honey flies out, and then empty frames come out on this side. So Muhammad is taking those empty frames, putting them back into a box, ready for the bees to use all over again. So we don't destroy the frames or the wax, uh, but we are able to get the honey out. The honey and wax that come off the cappings on cavity go down into a, another centrifuge called the wax spinner. And wax, it's got a perforated basket inside, the honey flies out the perforations, the wax stays inside. And that way we're able to, to separate wax and honey. Honey flows down into this tank here. There's a pump here. And when that pump turns on, the honey gets pumped up through this hose and over into the settling tank if we saw a moment ago. When we fill up barrels of honey, we then need to put the honey into a jar. So we bring the barrel in here and then we run it through a pump and we fill up the, the jars under here, and that's pretty much it. There's not a lot of processing involved in honey, it's just getting it out of the bowl and then cleaning it up a little bit. So let's move uh, 
upstairs to where we sell our items. Tidying up herself. She likes to keep the honey looking perfect there. Everything's symmetrical and full. As soon as I take a jar out of there, she's in there replacing it. So this is the, some of the products that we have for sale here. We produce liquid honey. We produce cold honey, honey that's still in the comb. And then we produce raw honey, so honey that hasn't been heated or filtered. And Janet will explain a little bit about what raw honey is, is all about. Sure. Raw honey, um, basically, it has uh, healing properties. Um, actually, there's been a project at the OBC, at the university here, um, where they were treating um, animal patients, cats and dogs, with raw honey on wounds where um, your antibiotics couldn't go through the body to get to the wound because of the circulatory system being disturbed. So they would use raw honey um, on these uh, burn wounds and um, just big infections in the skin, and they had amazing results. Um, so this this little jar here that Paul was pointing to, that's uh, our 40 milliliter first aid honey, and we recommend people keep one of those around for any scrapes or cuts or burns, and you can um, apply that to your wound and um, watch it heal faster. And how long is honey good for? Honey is it's good for a very, very long time, and indefinitely if you store it properly. Uh, the problem is to keep moisture from entering the honey because it's such a low moisture content, it will actually attract moisture into it. So if you keep it tightly sealed and moisture can't get in, you can't dilute the honey. And so then it will last for a very long time. We've also got products that we produce with propolis, the tree resins that these mm. collect that we were talking about earlier. So these are propolis products. We have propolis in honey. We have a propolis throat spray. And we have a tincture that can be used to apply to wounds. It is antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal. That's why the trees produce it, is a sealant and to keep the trees from getting infected. Bees collect it for the same purposes as a sealant and for, for an antifungal, antiviral, antibacterial uh, effects. So when we kind of collect it for bees, we basically just scrape extra bits out of the hive and then we're able to process it basically by dissolving it in alcohol and uh, then it can be used for uh, a whole variety of purposes. Uh, people will use it for cold sores because it will kill the virus, the herpes virus that causes cold sore and many uh, oral uh, issues. Uh, we're kind of new to the, uh, propolis here in North America but it's really widely used in Euro Europe and it's Central and South America. So there's lots more to discover about propolis and all the health benefits of all the products. So we've got propolis, pollen, honey, all kinds of different value-added things you can do with honey as well. And uh, royal jelly is another product can be produced. Bee venom can be used for therapeutic benefits. So those are all products, but then there's uh, uh, beekeepers sell queen bees, they sell collies, so there's income generated that way. They provide pollination service and that's really huge. So our bees provide pollination for a third, a third of the food that we eat uh, wouldn't be available without bee pollination. And of that, 80% of that pollination is conducted by honeybees. So all bees are important, but honey, honeybees are especially important for food production. So those beekeepers that move their hives into, for example, an apple orchard, are paid by the grower for providing that pollination service. That's a big part of the economic uh, success of our beekeepers is this pollination service that they provide. And is it true it will help allergies if you eat bee pollen from around where you live? Uh, I would actually caution people about bee pollen. If you're going to eat bee pollen, start with a very, very small amount because you can have an allergic reaction to bee pollen. Uh, our honey, our raw honey especially, is a better uh, source to help prevent uh, an allergy. Tiny, tiny amounts, trace amounts of windblown pollens, the pollens that bees uh, 
they're poems that people respond to, um, ends up in the honey. So if you eat uh, local raw honey, you're eating some of the pollen that causes your allergies, but at a tiny amount that won't really cause symptoms, but it can build your immunity. Uh, when pollen, it, like a lot of trees produce pollen that, that just blows in the wind, and that's what gets in your nose. Your nose is very similar to the stigma on the flower. It's kind of moist, kind of sticky, so the pollen gets in there, it germinates, and it tries to fertilize your nose. Oh. So what you're reacting to is the chemicals produced in that germination of the pollen inside your body. Uh, so that's, that's the story there with the uh, uh, building an immunity to pollen allergies. Good to know. Um, we have a question from the audience here. Is why does honey we keep at home at room temperature still become crystallized? Uh, that's a natural process. Honey is a super saturated solution. So in other words, there's more sugars dissolved in the amount of water that's there than you could dissolve at room temperature. So any super saturated solution that's natural state is in a crystallized form because eventually it will crystallize. And the way crystallization works in honey is if you have one crystal inside a liquid jar of honey, it acts as a seed for further crystal growth. So this is a little crystal, you'll get another crystal growing there and another one there, and another one there, and eventually the whole jar crystallizes. In our raw honey, we actually encourage that crystallization, and cream honey is the same thing. It's a process that is developed right here at Ontario Agriculture College. Uh, it's used throughout the world, but the process of creaming honey is a way of causing crystallization to happen in a way that you have very small crystals, so they're nice and smooth in your mouth, and uh, not coarse and grainy. So that's uh, one of our successes. Uh, we've developed techniques for collecting pollen that are used throughout the world. And uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, bee health that's uh, been uh, foundational for research that's done around the rest of the world. So we're, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, we have some successes in the past, but there's always more to do. Great. And how is pollen for consumption collected? Uh, well, there's a, when the bees come home from the hive, they have the pollen on their legs. Remember when we are doing all this? <laughs> so the pollen is on their legs here. When they go in the entrance to a pollen trap, uh, they go through the entrance and then they have to go up through a screen. And as they wriggle through the screen, the pollen gets knocked off their legs and it drops down through another screen that bees can't get through into a tray that we can pull out and collect the pollen. You might think that's hard on a colony, but what happens is it when we take some pollen from the bees, they preferentially forage for more pollen because they're not getting enough, so they'll collect more. And our pollen trap is only 85% efficient, so in other words, 15% can keep coming through that screen in smaller loads and they're still able to get all the pollen they need, even though we're taking some of it. But still, we only uh, collect that pollen at key times when they can produce a surplus of pollen. We want to make sure they have enough because anything that we do that hurts bees is not good for us either. Of course. All right, let's move on. Thank you, Janet. Here. <laughs> Thanks, Janet. So we're back outside. Here's our little bee garden. There you can see bees working on oregano. Anything in the herb family is a fantastic bee plant. And over here we have our catalpa, beauty bush, Japanese lilac. Everywhere you look, you can see plants that benefit bees. Another question I have for you is how do bees find the pollen and nectar? How do they know where to go? Well, uh, I like that question. That's great. The, they fly out from the hive and they're, on, well, they're exploring. When they become an older bee, they become a forager bee. They've already learned their local environment because they go out to the bathroom and uh, have to be able to find their way home again. So they do close flights when they're younger. And as they get older, they fly further and further afield. And they're collecting uh, different things. They collect nectar, they collect pollen, they collect propolis, and they also collect water. If it's really hot outside, 
they can use the pulp, the water, as it, uh, to evaporate inside the hive to bring the temperature down. So they're able to heat the hive in the winter and cool it in the summer. Very, that's called thermal regulation. They're fantastic at that. Amazing. Uh, to find the flowers, they uh, go for color and then they go for scent when they get even closer and then they're able to zoom in on those flowers and if they find a really abundant source of nectar and pollen they just can't help themselves they want to share that news with everybody else when they get home so as soon as they get in the hive they do what's called a waggle dance and on what i like to call the dance floor it's just at the bottom <laughs> of the frames near the entrance and so they land they come in there and they'll exude a little droplet of nectar that gives the bees the scent that they're trying to find and so they'll put a little bit out like that and they'll get that scent. Uh, then they do a dance where they waggle their abdomen and walk. So I'll just demonstrate that a little bit. If I want to tell uh, another bee or several other bees where to fly, they do this relative to where the sun is in the sky. The sun's right over there. So if the flowers are straight towards the sun, the dance would be straight up and down. They can convert up and down to meaning towards the sun or away from the sun. So you get it? I hope so. I uh, think so. So I'm going to dance towards the sun. So I waggle my abdomen like that and I walk. And then I turn left and I come around here. I waggle my abdomen and I turn right. So I just keep doing that and the other bees watch, smell and learn. And what they're learning is the direction indicates what direction to fly. The length of time that the waggle takes, that the waggle portion of the dance takes, that length of time indicates how far to fly. So the bees that learn that information then eat just enough honey to fly that distance. So when they get there, their honey stomach is empty and that maximizes how much they can bring home. It's amazing. Wow, it's fascinating. Um, another question from the audience here is how effective or safe do you think the flow hives are for Ontario climate and for meeting bee needs? Well, um, the flow hive is basically uh, the only advantage to that <coughs> is that it makes harvesting honey a little bit easier. Uh, and you still have to do all the other kinds of management that would be involved in taking care of your bees to keep them healthy and productive. So it doesn't eliminate all those other things. Uh, it can work quite well here in Ontario. Uh, it's something that's suited for very small scale beekeepers, people that have one or two hives, uh, but it means that they don't need to buy expensive extracting equipment. Uh, you can buy extracting equipment for every scale, from one beehive to 100,000 beehives. But uh, this uh, flow system, you just turn a crank and the honey leaks out of the frame. It basically, turning a crank basically disrupts the cell. It breaks the cell, so the honey leaks down into a little tray or a little trough, and then that comes out of the back of the hive. Uh, we have a couple volunteers that have these hives in their backyard, and uh, they love them. Uh, I don't personally have a lot of experience with them, but we're going to get some experience with that new hive that we've got. Great. Uh, we have a question from a first-time beekeeper here. Um, when will you treat for varroa mites this year, or when do you typically treat for them? And um, there's wax moth larva in the hive. What do you do about that? All right, well, let's start with the wax moth. Two part. The uh, uh, wax moth are kind of a pest. They're not a real major problem. If you have a productive, healthy colony, they can't uh, thrive. They basically uh, move into areas of comb where the bees aren't protecting them because bees hate them. Like they'll rip and tear and then chuck them out of the hive and they, they just don't allow them to uh, occupy space inside the hive. But the moths lay eggs around the perimeter of the hive at cracks and then those eggs hatch out and little tiny, tiny little larvae crawl in through the cracks and then they would get into inaccessible spaces, places where the bees can't get at. And that's, that's it if the hive is strong. If the hive is really weak, and they have a lot of extra comb, then the moths can start proliferating in unprotected areas. Uh, 
mostly wax moth are a problem in stored equipment. They only thrive in very warm temperatures, so we store our comb in cool temperatures and they're not a problem. Now, as far as the varroa mites are concerned, their population grows through the year, so it peaks late summer, early September. And so if we are going to, uh, we, so what we do is we monitor those levels of mites by uh, putting little uh, sticky papers on the bottom hive and seeing how many mites are falling down onto them. And if there are a large number of mites, then we need to do something with our colony. Uh, what we're focused on here is working on uh, natural chemicals that will kill the mites. Products that are essential oils from the plants, uh, largely herbs, but also organic acids like formic acid and oxalic acid. So there's, that's a whole big story there. Come take one of our courses and you'll learn more about that. Perfect. Um, so to get involved as a student, you can do any of the OAC programs, especially environmental sciences ones. There's, there's courses specifically for these, um, these skills and, and to learn more about bees, bee biology, like Paul said earlier. Um, if you want to learn more about beekeeping in general in the Honeybee Research Center, where should they go? Uh, go to our website. That's a great place to start. And there's all kinds of information there that you can follow up on uh, and get in touch with us. Awesome. Any advice for a future beekeeper? Get into it. It's fun. It's really <laughs> interesting. Uh, but it is a commitment, and it's a financial commitment, time commitment, and a commitment to learn so that you can have success and your bees can stay healthy. Awesome. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll, I will see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.